I want to make my apologies for not making this presentation in person, but visa difficulties and some of my other travel plans have left me with no passport, and so I'm unable to come to Montpellier. Sebastian and Arnaud have kindly allowed me to give my presentation in video, though. So, with many thanks for your indulgence, here goes. Modern Darwinism presents itself as a coherent philosophy of evolution, with all the answers either in hand already or truly about to come, as long as we remain true to its tenets. Here, we have to be a bit careful about what kind of Darwinism we're talking about. Arguably, the Darwinism of Charles Darwin is markedly different in nature and scope from what we call Darwinism today. Modern Darwinism is, for example, informed by a far deeper knowledge of the nature of heredity than Darwin himself could have had. This means that the two Darwinisms, if I may call them that, are grounded on markedly different philosophical foundations. While Darwin was, at least early on in his thinking, consumed with the problem of adaptation, modern Darwinism is consumed with heredity. Where classical Darwinism was rooted in the phenomenology of life itself, modern Darwinism has demoted life to a subsidiary outcome of gene expression. To illustrate, consider how William Paley's writings on natural theology, with its focus on the marvelous contrivances and harmony of living nature, adaptation in a word, so inspired the young Charles Darwin. Contrast this with how we are likely to regard such arguments today, which will range predictably from quaint curiosity to outright hostility. Or consider Darwin's own intellectual evolution on adaptation and its relation to heredity. Although Darwin shifted away from his early adaptationist mindset, when he turned his attention seriously to the problem of heredity, adaptation still loomed large in his thinking. Just witness Darwin's pangenesis theory, with its gemules, particles of adaptation really, flowing to and fro about the body, prompted by the use and disuse of the various parts. This theory was thoroughly, if only implicitly, Lamarckian, that is to say, adaptationist in its approach. Modern Darwinism, in contrast, is relentlessly focused on heredity, specifically on evolution as the selection of genes. This has shoved aside many of the fundamental problems that motivated the early evolutionists Darwin included. Phenomena like adaptation, biological design, cognition, consciousness, mind, and so forth. Arguably, modern Darwinism's most significant achievement has been to divorce evolution from the phenomenon of life itself. And so, we have the curious state of affairs of a supposedly coherent theory of evolution that has distanced itself from large swathes of territory that we might expect any truly coherent theory properly to encompass. For example, there is today no fully coherent Darwinian theory of the origin of life. We are in this position largely because we have painted ourselves into a philosophical corner. If Darwinian evolution is the selection of units of heredity, as modern Darwinism insists, how then is a Darwinian theory of the origin of life even possible when the emergence of life had to have included, at some point, a period when there were no units of heredity? Neither is there a coherent Darwinian theory for what some, including me, would argue are fundamental phenomena of living systems. Indeed, modern Darwinism tends to approach these notions with something akin to evasion. Consider, for example, the problem of biological design. It should be an uncontroversial assertion that living systems exhibit many of the properties of a design system. They are, in fact, put together quite well and function with remarkable coordination and integration. And given the infinitude of ways that living systems might not work well, the remarkable thing is that life does work well, and that it does exhibit what we might call designedness. This demands explanation. 
For many years, the standard Darwinian explanation has been that this is apparent design, the result of past selection of good function. This is an evasion that simply kicks the can back into the past. For a supposedly coherent theory of evolution, this is rather thin broth. We see this quite dramatically in the questions that are being addressed in this session, issues related to the nature of the individual and the scale at which adaptation and natural selection operate. There has been, for many years now, a simmering dispute over the supposed unit of natural selection. In the world of gene selectionism, the logical answer is quite obviously the gene, and we're all familiar with the arguments made forcefully and eloquently by people like Richard Dawkins. There are many other points of view on this, though, with candidates for the focus of natural selection ranging in scale from individual organisms to social groups to so-called superorganisms to communities to ecosystems and even the biosphere itself. Generally, these alternatives have met with pretty stiff resistance. Where acceptance has come, as in David Sloan Wilson's arguments about group selection, progress has come only insofar as the solution is grounded in the gene selectionist paradigm. What has been missing from much of this discussion, though, has been a clear idea of what the organism is. In the gene selectionist idea, the organism is a vehicle for the propagation of genes. Fair enough. This works pretty well if we imagine that the organism is a well-defined entity that bears a close relationship to the genes that supposedly specify it. However, a striking motif of the evolution of life on Earth is the widespread emergence of what we might call organism-like systems. The most obvious example, of course, is the organism itself, the visible manifestation of an individual. However, organism-like systems can encompass a variety of other living phenomena, including, most obviously, social insect colonies and symbiotic organisms, but which can include systems that might seem the antithesis of the organism. Associations such as microbial mat communities, reef ecosystems, and so forth. And, as we learn more and more about the essentially symbiotic nature of individual organisms, the importance of skin and gut microflora, for example, even the idea of the organism as a specified phenotype of a coherent genome is running into trouble. All these systems do, however, have something in common. What makes this problematic for modern Darwinism is that it's not genetics that unifies them, but physiology. To see what I mean by this, we have to define physiology in a quite fundamental way. Specifically, we can define an organism-like system as any physical system that sustains a persistent and specified thermodynamic disequilibrium. Living systems are highly ordered assemblages of matter, which, in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics, tend inexorably to thermodynamic equilibrium. To counter this tendency, a living system mobilizes a stream of free energy to do thermodynamic work, namely mobilizing a stream of disordered matter and pushing it into a state of specified orderliness, that is to say thermodynamic disequilibrium. Furthermore, the matter must be pushed into a state of highly specified disequilibrium, one that is ordered in just such a way that matter and energy flow through the system in highly specified ways. As long as the work continues, the living system persists. And when the work stops, life stops, and the ordered system then dissipates back to equilibrium. This is the meaning of death and decay. Many physical systems do order-producing work, of course, and it's legitimate to ask what is it about a living physical system that makes it distinctively living. To illustrate, let's look at two physical systems that are superficially similar, cumulus clouds and cauliflowers. Both are white, puffy, and both are manifestations of order-producing physical work. No one would have any trouble distinguishing the cauliflower as a living physical system, though, and the cumulus cloud as a non-living system. This means that there is something about the logic of the cauliflower that is distinct from the logic of the cumulus cloud. 
what might that distinction be? In the case of the cumulus cloud, free energy in the form of large-scale gradients of temperature and humidity are tapped to the order-producing work of condensation and turbulent flow that produce the cumulus cloud. As long as that free energy is there, the cumulus cloud persists. When the free energy source disappears, the cumulus cloud disappears also. The cauliflower shares some of these attributes. Both the cumulus cloud and the cauliflower are dissipative thermodynamic systems in the fourth law sense of Stuart Kaufman. But what makes the cauliflower distinctively alive is its adaptability. Where the cumulus cloud can only exist in circumstances specified by the environment, the cauliflower is driven by an internal logic of persistence that is simply lacking in the cumulus cloud. As free energy and material feedstocks come and go, the cauliflower actively seeks energy sources and structures environments to ensure that flows of matter and energy persist to just the degree needed to offset the inevitable depredations of the second law. The cumulus cloud's persistence, such as it is, has no such internal logic. Its logic is entirely that of the environment. The logic of the living thermodynamic system governs not just the living system itself, but the environment in which it's embedded. This has implications both for the definition of the organism and for the scale at which organism-like systems can exist. Specifically, the logic leads inevitably to something I call the extended organism. Let's recast our definition of a thermodynamic living system slightly. Operationally, this consists of an adaptive boundary that separates an internal environment from an external environment. The disequilibrium is maintained by free energy being used to drive what we'll call a physiological flux, or PF, across the adaptive boundary. The dissipation of orderliness, namely that driven by the second law, proceeds in the opposite direction across the boundary in what we can call a thermodynamically favored flux, or TFF. Persistence of the thermodynamic system occurs when the physiological flux is always matched to the thermodynamically favored flux. This is homeostasis. Homeostasis does not come without a cost. Remember that the physiological flux requires work to be done. The magnitude of the work will be proportional to the magnitude of the thermodynamic disequilibrium that is maintained across the boundary. If the external environment is driven chaotically, which it often is, the energy cost of homeostasis will range widely and will be unpredictable. This will have consequences for adaptation. In short, adaptation to an unpredictable environment will be more costly and unpredictable than will adaptation to a predictable environment. These costs can be brought back under control by constructing a new adaptive boundary that can impose homeostasis on the new environment behind it. Basically, this ploy creates a new environment and imposes homeostasis on it. In principle, there should be no limit on the extent of nesting one environment behind another. We see this in the nested levels of organization within organisms themselves, and we see it even in superorganisms, like this social insect colony. This is a cross-section through the mound and colony built by a species of mound-building termites constructed above the large subterranean nest. This mound is an adaptive boundary that encloses the colony. It regulates the capture of wind energy to help power the exchange of respiratory gases with the atmosphere. And it's constructed as a homeostatic device. It not only captures wind energy, but it regulates its capture as well. And it does so with only the cost of building and maintaining the mound, which surprisingly amounts to less than 10% of the colony's total energy budget. Indeed, there's no inherent reason why this nesting could not extend to the entire biosphere. This, of course, is the logic that underpins the Gaia hypothesis. In the past several years, we've seen a proliferation of what we might call theories of alternative Darwinism, including Evo Devo, Symbiogenesis, 
Gaia theory, and most recently, niche construction theory. All strive to ground themselves firmly in the Darwinian tradition, but all have faced varying degrees of controversy, in part because they all have pushed, in one way or another, the philosophical limits set by modern gene-centered theories of Darwinism. Much of this tension is driven by the inherent contradictions between the two Darwinisms I alluded to earlier. Neither alone can presume to being a coherent theory of evolution, but together they just might. Take, for example, Gaia theory. When Gaia theory was first proposed, it came under fierce attack by mainstream, that is to say, gene selectionist, evolutionary biologists. The criticisms were motivated primarily by a philosophical outlook that could not possibly accommodate such a theory. Yet, from a physiological point of view, particularly in light of the idea of the extended organism, Gaia theory makes perfect sense. Can these be brought together into a coherent evolutionary theory? I think so, but it will mean rethinking some core evolutionary concepts. Take, for example, the notion of fitness. In the gene selectionist world, fitness is object-based, replication of genes or organisms. In a physiological outlook, fitness is process-based, the persistence of living thermodynamic systems. These two definitions of fitness differ radically. Can they be reconciled? I propose that they can, and that the path to reconciliation starts with the extended organism.